Well, it's great to be together this morning. What a beautiful time of worship. Great to be able to worship God together. So if you're here with us, if visiting, and you're here for uh, this bank holiday weekend, staying with family and friends, if you're a visitor for the first time, it's great to have you amongst us. So we're going to uh, be unpacking um, a verse from Isaiah 61 and verse 7. It's the next in our series, Anointed, and this morning the title is From Shame to Fruitfulness. So I'm going to read a verse in a moment from Isaiah chapter 61 verse 7, and then I'm going to read some verses from Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. And so uh, this is what they say. So Isaiah 61 verse 7. In place of your shame, you will have a double portion. In place of disgrace, they will rejoice over their share. So they will possess double in in their land, and eternal joy will be theirs. Now from Genesis chapter 2, the last verse in Genesis chapter 2. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt No shame. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you won't die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened And they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. Today we're talking about shame. I remember years ago, uh, we were uh, in a a park in, we went, took the kids to America, had the privilege of being able to do that, kids were a lot younger, and uh, we were in one of the water parks, and there was this... Uh, it's like a big helter skelter. It's a big slide, and so you go up uh, the 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 slide to the top, and then you get on, and then the water takes you down the chute. And so I was taking the kids up, and we queued for ages to get up there. And uh, so everybody's, uh, you know, obviously in shorts, and uh, it's hot. And uh, and as I'm going up, I'm conscious that there are lots of uh, guys around who are perhaps my age, a bit younger, um, but they're really tanned. They've got their six packs out. And uh, so my, my six pack was well packed away with the rest of the shopping. <laughs> and um, so we go up the slide, get to the top, and you, as you go up, you had to take a mat with you because you slid down on a mat. And um, we get to the top, and one of the kids uh, uh, basically put their mat down, let go, and the, it just shot down slide and like the guy behind me said come on man give your mat to one of your kids and you're like ah oh, blow so so I, I, I did did the, did the right thing every father should do gave uh, the, the mat to uh, the, the child and, um, uh, and uh, uh, they go down the slide and I have to walk all the way back down and as I'm walking down I'm like really trying to suck it in, you know, (laughs) as I'm walking down. And there are these guys, as I'm walking down, I'm walking down the side, I'm walking uh, past these guys, and this guy goes, walk a shame, man, walk a shame. (laughs) And I'm like, like, you you have no idea what I've just sacrificed. 
Shame is a terrible thing. Much of our world is marked by an honor and shame culture. In the past, our Western culture has typically been more shaped by guilt and forgiveness. But that's no longer the case. In 21st century Britain, shame is an epidemic. A look at last Wednesday's newspaper headlines would tell a story. In the mirror, two articles. The first one, it says this, shamed Harris's secret funeral. Talking about Rolf Harris. And the, the second headline said this, cops pro Boris again. And the first line of it said this, shamed Boris Johnson has been referred to the police again. Shame is weaponized in our social media, and it's what's driving a cancel culture. Fear of what people uh, will say and do is, is just uber controlling. And of course, the, the, the Rolf Harris story just underlines that there are some things that we should be ashamed of. One day we're all going to stand before God and have to give an account of the life that we lived and none of us in that day will want to know shame. You see, we all experience shame in different ways at different times over different things. For some of us feel shame over broken relationships, over divorce, not having children, our children not walking with God. Battles over our sexuality and identity. Unfulfilled goals. Affairs. Bankruptcy. Unemployment. Academic achievement. For some of us, we just don't, didn't do well in school. For some of us, went to university and didn't do well. We have battles over our regrets of things that we've done in the past. Struggles with sin over addictions, maybe pornography, greed. Maybe we struggle with debt. Maybe we feel shame because we know we are battling with mental health issues. Maybe we feel shame over our appearance. Maybe that's what drives us on social media, having to look the part. Failures in ministry, in church. Shame over things done to us or said about us. And the list goes on and on. Have you a cloud of shame hanging over you this morning? When the subject comes up, when that subject comes up, do you die with shame inside? Shame is like Japanese knotweed. Once it gets a root in your heart, it's so difficult to get rid of. It just grows and shadows everything. We just can't kill it. You know, I used to feel like that. I lived with shame for years. Shame and I were roommates. What is shame? Well, the psychologist and author Brené Brown has researched it. She famously did a TED talk and uh, they were over, it's entitled, Listen to Shame. And it went viral with over 60 million, 60 million views. She defines shame as this. The intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love, belonging, and connection. Is that how you feel today? Isaiah chapter 61 verse 7 promises that God doesn't want us to experience shame. He wants us instead to enjoy fruitfulness, to know joy in his presence. He wants us to know a double portion. And the passage that we read from Genesis chapter uh, 1 tells us that God creates us male and female. 
He creates us in his image. Everything God creates is perfect. We're told at the end of Genesis 20, uh, chapter 1, that God created everything and it was very good. It was very good. Adam and Eve were naked and they knew no shame. You know, God could have used any word. He could have said, they were naked and they knew no fear. They were naked and they knew no condemnation. They knew no anxiety. But God uses the word, they knew no shame. You see, shame is more significant than any of us think or realize. You see, Adam and Eve com were completely vulnerable before God and each other. There was no indignity, there was no embarrassment, there was no disgrace. Their relationship with each other and with God was intimate and deep. Their days were joy-filled. That is how it is meant to be. We're created to live in harmony and complement each other. Together we are created to be fruitful and to enjoy a fruitful relationship with God and each other. But somehow our relationships have been corrupted. Shame has covered us. Shame stops us from being all that God has called us to be. Kurt Thompson, a Christian writer, says that shame's goal is to dismantle us as individuals and communities and destroy all of God's creation. Shame is so destructive. It makes us unfruitful. It steals our joy. And today we're going to look at three things. The impact of shame the antidote to shame, and the promise of fruitfulness. And so the first thing we're going to look at is this, the impact of shame. In Genesis chapter 2, we see the devil tempting Adam and Eve, and they eat the forbidden fruit. It's a story we know well if we've read our Bibles. And in a moment, intimacy with God is lost. Their eyes are opened, and they realize that they're naked. What do they do? They sow leaves together and they hide. For the first time, they feel shame and fear. Shame tells us, shame tells us that we are not good enough. Guilt tells us that I did something wrong or I did something bad. Shame tells us that we are bad. That's the lie that it sows. Shame goes hand in hand with hiddenness, fear, anxiety, judgmentalism, broken relationships. Shame's power grows when it's hidden, when it's unmentioned, when it's ignored and avoided. The devil wants to cloak us in shame and steal our identity as children of God. Adam and Eve knew that they were created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 tells us that. They knew they'd been created in the image of God, that they were different from every other animal. And yet when the devil says, if you eat, your eyes will be opened and you, were, you will be like God, they believe a lie. They were already like God. And they believe a lie. And they end up living in shame. Their identity stolen. What about you? Are you living in shame? Is shame keeping us from living the joy-filled lives that God has for us? You see, shame damages relationship with God and those around us. It stops us being fruitful. Shame disconnects us. We can't look people in the eye. We withdraw for fear of being found out, for being seen and as a fraud. 
and worse, it impacts how we treat other people. Someone once said, shamed people shame. When we're living with shame, it becomes a second nature to make others feel shame when they fail. I don't know about you, but when you're driving in your car and you're driving along and someone beeps the horn at you, I don't know about you, in, in, when you're in, there's a crowd of traffic and someone beeps the horn because maybe you've left your indicator doing or, or, or uh, going or, or done something. I don't know about that feeling that comes over you. It's just like, oh no, oh, how embarrassing, oh no. People are looking at me, they're all looking, oh, the, flick the indicator back up. How quickly though we do it to other people. Shamed people, shame. Shame is so prevalent amongst us as, as Christians because sin is still alive in our bodies. And we become ashamed of our failures and our weaknesses. And we hide them from others and we hide them from God or we try to. We may not use leaves to hide our shame. But we hide in other ways. We wear a mask to hide behind so people never really get to see the real us. We shut the door on parts of our past so no one will find out the shame that we're hiding. We avoid certain subjects and topics like the plague. We hide behind our busyness. We hide behind humor. We hide behind being a bit brusque and standoffish. We create distractions to avoid the real issue that's under the surface. We hide behind the walls of our home or our office, behind housework, computers, TV, phones, books, headphones, dark glasses, sports, hobbies. We hide behind our appearance, clothes, even our roles in church. Where are we hiding today? God wants us to know there's an antidote to shame. Brenny Brown says this, the fire of shame is fed by silence, judgment, and secrecy. Left to burn, it can damage all aspects of our lives. And yet it doesn't have to be this way. Empathy has the potential to put out the flames, turn down the heat, and stop throwing fuel on the fire. After Adam and Eve sin, God comes and calls them. What does he say? He doesn't say, what have you done? He knows what they've done. He says, where are you? He knows where they are. But he's looking to restore intimate relationship. He wants them back with him. And a shame is doing its worst in the garden. We see the gospel. God comes looking for us in our shame. He gently calls us out from our hiding place. It's the start of freedom from shame. Tim Keller puts it like this. Get out from behind that tree. The only way you'll get over your fear, the only way you'll get over that, the trauma that's happened to your soul, the only way you'll be happy again is if you're naked and unashamed. Come out from behind that tree. Open yourself to me. Admit what you've done. Come to me. I will clothe you. I will cover your sin. The antidote to shame is a relationship with God. Knowing him and being completely known by him. It's the most vulnerable place to be. But it's the place where he clothes us. See how he clothes Adam and Eve in the beginning. They've tried sewing together fig leaves. And God comes and sacrifices the first animal. And he covers them. It's a blood sacrifice. And he takes He takes the skin of the animal, and he clothes them. God covers their shame. Here, in relationship with God, we find vulnerability. We find intimacy with him again and afterwards with each other. We have a father who totally 
understands our weakness, we're told in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. He's a God who completely empathizes with us. He just doesn't say, oh, shame. He comes and he comes to us and he draws close. And he loves us and he understands us and gets our problem. The incarnation, Jesus becoming man, is the greatest It's the greatest demonstration of empathy this world will ever see. God experienced our shame. And through Jesus, we receive the antidote. Through his sacrifice, we're covered. We are freed from shame. How does that happen? It happens at the cross. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we're told this. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are you battling with shame? Then fix your eyes on Jesus. He hung naked on a cross in front of the crowds, the religious leaders who all poured their, sh- their mocking, their shame on him. And Jesus carried it all for you. He who had never done anything wrong carried it for you. He paid the price. He died carrying your shame. And he, get, he rose from the tomb, leaving your shame behind in the tomb and rose and gives you freedom. It's why Paul can say that in Christ we will never be put to shame. Never be put to shame. If you're here today and you've never put your trust in Jesus, you can be free of shame. Jesus Christ will set you free and you can know a Father in heaven, intimacy with a Father in heaven who loves you and will never leave you or forsake you. Be with you to the very end. It's the gospel. And amongst God's people, there should be a safe place for us to be real and authentic, to be vulnerable together as we're vulnerable before God, knowing that we're loved and accepted and not judged. And sadly, that's not always been our experience. Over the years, I've heard people talk about the walk of shame. And they describe it like this, that there was this sense that if you responded to God, uh, to, uh, uh, to God on a Sunday morning and that you went to the front, it was somehow, it was the walk of shame because you were exposing your vulnerabilities. I remember people telling me that. It's the walk of shame. What a lie. What bondage is held people in for years. We come, as we come before God, we leave our shame at the foot of the cross and he sets us free. It's the walk of freedom. It's the walk of freedom. Jesus is the antidote to shame. And if we come to him, there's a promise of fruitfulness. This is what it says in Isaiah 61 verse 7 again. In the place of your shame, you will have a double portion It promises a day when we will know fruitfulness that God originally intended for us. A double portion. The blessing a father gave to his firstborn son in the Old Testament. And it's the blessing he gives to us through his firstborn son, Jesus Christ. Who had been with him through all eternity but was born a man. Whatever was lost in the beginning, Jesus restores over and above anything we could ever imagine or ever dream of. Anything we ever deserve. In Christ, God clothes us with honor and dignity. This is the unmerited, undeserved grace of God. We become children of God and know his great unconditional love for us. It's our identity. It's who he created us to be. 
He is always with us. He promises us life to the full. Fruitfulness. God's plan is by His Spirit dwelling within us, we can live lives that please God, fulfilling His plan and purpose for our lives. Listen to God's plan for us. This is what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not be ashamed about anything. I will not be ashamed about anything. But now as as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. God created us for fruitfulness and joy, for this life and for eternity. That's what Isaiah 61 verse 7 promises. So how does Jesus take our shame and make us fruitful? Well, Jesus tells a parable which explains it. In Luke chapter 15, he tells a story of two sons. The younger son brings shame on his father. He brings shame by asking for his inheritance. The father is still alive. Effectively, he is saying, I wish you were dead because I want my inheritance now. And he brings shame on his father, he brings shame on his family, and he brings shame on his community. And he disappears into a far country and squanders is his inheritance. He lives in shame, far from home. And then one day he comes to his senses. And he thinks, if I go back home, my father's home, even the servant's, eat better than I'm eating now. And so he heads home thinking, he's going to say to his father, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. His identity is lost. And as he arrives, he's some distance from home, and the father is watching for him and sees him. And the father runs to him and brings him home. He covers his shame. You see, if the father hadn't gone and got him, the community probably would have stoned him because of the shame he'd brought on them. It's a huge issue in that culture. And so the father comes in and brings him home in safety. And the son starts to say, I, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the, the father shuts him down and says, no. And he puts sandals on his feet, the sandals of sonship. He's no longer a slave. He puts a ring on his finger, the ring of authority, and he clothes him. He puts a garment over him and covers his shame. His shame is dealt with. And then he throws a party. There's a celebration. They kill the fatted calf. And there is a celebration and joy fills the house. Joy forevermore. Shame is replaced with joy. The Gospels are full of encounters where Jesus, with Jesus where this happens. The woman at the well who comes to the well at midday. She comes at midday because of her lifestyle. And she is ashamed and she knows if she comes at midday there won't be anybody else there. But Jesus is there. And she encounters Jesus and he unpacks her shame. She becomes vulnerable. He says... Where's your husband? She says, I don't have a husband. He says, that's right, you don't have a husband. You've had five and the guy you're living with isn't your husband. He exposes her shame so gently. And he sets her free. Her encounter with the risen Christ, she received living water that we heard about this morning. Water that changed her from the inside out. And this lady who lived in a community covered with shame then goes back to her, runs back to her community who wouldn't have had anything to do with her, would have shunned her. And she says, come and meet a man who's told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Messiah? And her community, she suddenly received back and shame is dealt with and she becomes fruitful. That can be your story today. He wants to set you free from shame. He doesn't want you living under a cloud of shame any longer. Jesus scorned 
the shame at the cross that you might be free. You see, shame leaves us flawed and hiding. Jesus sets us free. His grace is sufficient for us in all our weakness. In the 1980s, a band called Depeche Mode wrote a song called Shame. And one line of the song says this, Soap won't wash away your shame. Soap won't wash away your shame. Only Jesus' blood washes away shame. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 it says this, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? Today God wants to set you free from shame. I'm going to ask the band to come and join me. I'm going to ask you to respond to God. If you know that you have lived with shame, I tell you, I lived with shame for years. Whenever certain subjects came up, I would just shut down inside. I would change the conversation. I lived with shame. I was a follower of Jesus, but I I lived with shame. It was like a cloud that hung over me. And then one day, God set me free. And that was the verse at the end that helped set me free. Jesus' blood cleansed my conscience from acts that lead to death. What's the shame that's covering you today? What's the cloud that hangs over you? What is it that's robbing you of your identity in Christ? As a son and a daughter of God, loved, beloved of God, what's robbing you of fruitfulness? What's robbing you of joy? What is it? God wants to set you free and he's calling you to come out from behind where you're hiding. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. But where you are right now, I'm going to ask you before God to do some business. And John and the band are just going to play quietly or sing something over us in this moment. And I want you to do business with God. I want you to acknowledge that you've been hiding in shame. And acknowledge before God what the shame is. I feel ashamed because of this. I've believed a lie that I was unlovable, that I wasn't worthy, that I was never good enough. I've lived with this for too long. Jesus, would you come and take my shame away? I believe that you died on the cross. I believe at the cross you bore my shame. Would you come and wash away my shame, Lord Jesus? In this moment, right now, why don't you do that? band will play quietly. I just want you to reflect. Just do business with God where you are. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come right now and just touch hearts. Respond to the call of God to come. Be vulnerable before him. He already knows where you're hiding. He already knows the shame you carry.
Lord Jesus, we bring our shame to you. All our failures, all our mistakes, all the lies we've believed, the shame of things that we've done and the things, the shame of things that others have done to us, that we've lived with, that we've carried, the shame that's driven us into hiding, the shame that's caused broken relationships, the shame that has taken our joy and stolen our fruitfulness. Lord Jesus, we bring it to you, our great shame bearer. And we say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you took our shame on the cross. You scorned our shame, bore it for us, took the punishment, and then you left it in the tomb and rose again. And Lord Jesus, we want to walk in newness of this new life as new creations, knowing who we are in you, children of God. Come and help us walk in the freedom and the fruitfulness you've called us to do. Holy Spirit, come and seal this moment. Release people from shame. May the cloud of shame that's hung over them for years, Holy Spirit, blow it away. Move it away that they would stand in the light of the love of God. Holy Spirit, come and do that right now. We worship you, Lord Jesus, our great King and Captain. Amen. If you have done business with God this morning, then you are free. The Son, the Son has set us free. We are free indeed. So we're going to stand together and we're going to worship and we're going to celebrate what he's done for us.